here. So um, we will now listen to a talk of uh, Suma. September. I want to refer you to the 11th September 2001. Terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. At that time, His Holiness the Dalai Lama offered these words to the then President George Bush. I quote, We need to think seriously with the violent action is the right thing to do. And in the greater interest of the nation and people in the long run. I believe violence will only increase the cycle of violence. In a quote. President Bush responded by attacking Afghanistan and less than 18 months later, Iraq. He said his country's mission was, quote, to rid the world of evil, end of quote, emphasizing crusade against the excess of evil, namely Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. <coughs> I cringed when I heard his words, remembering that Hitler and Stalin also wanted to rid the world of evil. The great Russian author, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, wrote, I quote, If only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere, insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? In a quote. Conflict flare up over neighbor's fences and national borders while cleaning the kitchen or cleaning up the environment they involve our most intimate relationships or encounters with strangers conflicts are inevitable grappling with conflict provides the opportunity for knowledge healing and growth first we need to stop simply blaming the other party and identify where our own rigid and self-righteousness make their claim on us at the same time we must allow in others' viewpoints. 
when we have explore our own position thoroughly, it is easier to understand those with whom we are in conflict. Visualize the person you despise the most. Contemplate his or her features that make you most angry. Then think about what makes him happy and what makes him suffer. What motivates his actions? Try to see patterns. Meditating this way. Compassion and insight will arise in your heart. Like fresh water filling in spring. You may need to repeat the exercise many times before you have this experience. Eventually, your anger will vanish. Next, do the same exercise on yourself. You understand your own greed, hatred, and delusion. With a deeper understanding of yourself, you will see similarities with others. This is essential for preventing and resolving conflicts. When attacked, your choice is not simply between violence and inaction. Other responses, including dialogue, law enforcement, negotiation, and diplomacy are possible. When party takes the time to listen <coughs> to each other, animosity often dissolves. Rather than divide the world into good and evil, we need to see others first and foremost as our fellow human beings. When asked to summarize the Buddha's teaching, first century philosopher Nakarajuna answered in one word, Ahimsa, non-violence. Non-violence does not mean doing nothing. It is a proactive, comprehensive process of addressing conflicts through communication, and resource sharing. According to the Buddha, every act of violence is preceded by an intention, conscious or unconscious, <coughs> to create a culture of peace. We must begin by acknowledging the violence in our own hearts and then learn to disarm it. Greed, hatred, and ignorance is at the core of every violent action. <coughs> Wisdom and compassion are the base of every act of non-violence. Every one of our actions <coughs> has an effect in the Dhammapada, is a Buddhist book. The Buddha teaches, I quote, hate does not eradicate hatred. Only by loving kindness is hatred dissolved. This law is an ancient and eternal. End of quote. Gandhi summarizes it well. I quote, an eye for an eye just makes the whole world fly. <coughs> In a quote. <coughs> the Buddha also said, quote again, if you 
act with a corrupt mind, suffering referral. If you act with a peaceful mind, peace will follow. In a court. We cannot avoid the results of our action, our dhamma. We must be mindful of each act of our lives. Violence is not the result of a total political economy. Well, it springs from human consciousness. A culture of violence is one that produces, novelizes, and consumes ideas of division and hatred. Modern societies invest massively in war and violence. <coughs> the U.S. spends nearly half of the world's total. Follow distantly by the UK, France, Japan, and China. Almost every third world country also invests far too much in its own military budget. And many also host US bases in their territory. Martin Luther King Jr. observed that, I quote, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We must we have guided missiles and misguided men in the court. Gandhi noted, quote again, we are constantly being astonished at the amazing discoveries in the field of violence. But I maintain that far more undreamt of and seemingly impossible discoveries will be made in the field of non-violence. In the quote. We live in an age of both polarism and terror. And it is critical for us to articulate what might constitute a culture of peace. Non-violence in his Buddhism's master vision. Peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building <coughs> are three responses to conflict. Peacekeeping stops people from attacking each other. This minimizes the damage, but does not ensure stability. We need to put out the fire, but it would be better to prevent them in the first place by addressing and the life causes. Peacekeeping sometimes employs the means of conflict to end conflict. At other times, small numbers of people have been able to penetrate violent situations by practicing non-violence. When the Nazis tried to exterminate the Jews of Denmark, in Quintet the Nines of that country, declared that if his Jewish subjects were captured, he too would wear the Star of David and be subjected to arrest. As a result, the German did not touch the Danish Jew. But that's Khan, a devout Muslim, <coughs> known as the Gandhi of the Pakistan-Afghanistan frontier, was able to persuade his Western brothers, the most violent people around that area, to renounce arms and join him in 100,000 man army of non-violence. You should, you should not know. The 1923 overthrow of Thai dictatorship, the end of the Marcos government in the Philippines, and the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe are all examples of the use of non-violence to end violence and oppression and bring about lasting social change. 
the images of a lone protester standing in front of the tank in Tanmin Square, China, and the Aung San Suu Kyi confronting the Burmese military in Burma are reminders of the great moral and fiscal courage it takes to engage in nonviolence. Recently, there was a suffering revolution in Burma. The monks came out challenging dictatorship in the country. It was eight years ago. The monk who recited Mita Sutta. Mita Sutta is, is the Sutta came from the word of the Buddha. The meaning of the Sutta is that a mother willing to sacrifice her life for protecting her only child. Let's imitate that mother by sacrificing our life to protect our sentient beings. The man recited this sutta in Pali and they were beaten, some of them were killed, some of them were disrobed, some of them were tortured seven years ago and the monkey kept on doing that. At least now Burma has changed. All the monks are free. And two days ago, all political prisoners were free. Since 1962, dictatorship ended only last year. The paradigm articulated by President Bush needed to, to be dismantled. The true power of America is not its wealth or military might but its ideals of liberty, democracy, and generosity. We must stop investing in war and violence and invest instead in peace and non-violence. In this finish, that interviews a resolution in the U.S. Congress to create a cabinet-level department of peace. And this is also hopeful if you listen to Castro Cuba, the last communist leader in the West. He said the American government are the worst enemy of the Cuban government. But the American people are his best friends. And he said the young American have now become more and more non become more and more mindful. I think it's a great hope. The second response to conflict, peacemaking, involves not just intervening, but actually settling conflicts. The most important element of peacemaking is dialogue. What we call dialogue is often just two monologues. General dialogue requires active listening. We need to abandon our idea of a particular outcome and remain quiet within. With both sides feel hurt, creative problem solving can bring unanticipated results. Reconciliation is key. Acknowledging the past alleviates suffering, heals injustice, and fosters transformation, or restorative justice. Victim and perpetrator listen to each other deeply. Difficult as that may be, and as a result, both change. This kind of education, rather than punishment, minimizes free division. Peace building, the third response, is the never ending effort to create a peaceful society. It begins at the grassroots levels and includes a wide range of long term solutions. 
education, grassroots democracy, land reform, poverty alleviation, like the little parrot in the Buddhist Chattaka tale of the Buddha's former life. A peace builder mobilizes his community to bring water drop by drop to quench the raging fire. Peace building must be based on non-violence, which in turn must be based on wisdom and compassion. These kind of activities garner few headlines that are the most meaningful responses to conflict. Once a war has started, it is nearly impossible to stop. We need to stop the next war now by creating just and truly democratic societies. When the Buddha came to understand how suffering arises, he was able to transform the processes that cause and sustain it. He described these insights using the language of the Four Noble Truths. Suffering exists. Suffering has causes. We can stop producing the cause of suffering. A part of mindful living and so on. That's the way. Let us apply these four truths to situation of conflict. We begin by acknowledging both sides suffering. Each adversary state his experience clearly with witnesses present to acknowledge their statements. This is the first noble truth, the acknowledgement of suffering. Second, we try to understand the external and psychological roots of the conflict. When we project our emotions into an object, animate or inanimate, we explain the other as having traits which, in fact, dwell first in our own unconscious mind. We fail to see the line between object and our own feelings. To discover the rules of any conflict, we must also examine its psychological dimensions. With this understanding, we can explore the external conditions more clearly. The third noble truth is the cessation of the causes of suffering. This, not, this does not presuppose that we can reach a state that is conflict-free, but encourages us to grapple with the details, internal and external. Every time, conflict can be an opportunity to go directly to the heart of the matter and learn more about ourselves. The fourth noble truth. Peace is a way of life. Show us how, how to live in ways that reduce suffering and conflict. The Buddha called this the noble eightfold part. The middle way. One, Right understanding. Understanding the four noble truths. Two, right thought. Freedom from that which cannot bring satisfaction. Third, right speech. Speaking truthfully and skillfully. Fourth, right action. Not killing, stealing, or indulging in irresponsible sexual misbehavior. Fifth, 
livelihood, not engaging in profession that brings harm to others. Seek by effort, encouraging wholesome state of mind. Seven, right mindfulness, awareness of the physical and mental dimensions of our experience. Eight, right concentration, staying focused. The eightfold part encourages peace building as a way of life. It points to ways that awareness can be deepened and the parts of our lives brought into harmony. We begin by living mindfully, then we can use these tools to dismantle oppressive system and create a culture of peace. Thank you for your understanding. I am open for discussion, argument, question. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sulak. Um, I think you really like the way how you brought together the interconnectedness of politics, philosophy, uh, and human behavior on different levels, <coughs> local as well as national and global level, and taking the perspective of a global environment where people from so many countries around the world. Thank you very much. I think the floor is open now for questions from, from your side. Please. Uh, let me make one advertisement. If you want the text of this, Lecture, is, I took it from the book on sale outside, <coughs> The Wisdom of Sustainability, Buddhist economic in the 21st century, and the other one is Conflict Culture Change. These two books are available outside, and if you buy them, give you free autograph. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
practice alone and from behind. If a person does not practice these four steps of training, he or she is not a mature person. But I mentioned that the, the monks in Burma, they, at least seven years before they become rich, Aung San Suu Kyi had been put into house arrest for over 16 years. And she, when she received the Nobel Peace Prize, she wrote a book, Freedom from Fear. And all the top military people in Burma are afraid of her. They spent a lot of money on arms and so on. And now they have opened their country. Now Tibet is still under Chinese oppression. His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, we must love the Chinese. To hate them selfishly if you are hating yourself. We should never hate ourselves. And I see a lot of practical results. I know Tibetan very well. And I think one of these days, the Chinese too should say, you know, the last Chinese, or the only Chinese who received the Nobel Peace Prize, he could not be there. And he wrote, no hatred, no enemy. Chinese communist. And now, you know, a lot of truth is now prevailing in China. And a lot of Chinese are now becoming more and more spiritual. I think the Chinese Communist Party will crumble like the Soviet before them. Because the more you have the force of compassion, truth, I think that the way, and the Chinese, in fact, this man who wrote this book, you know, who received the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, the Tibetan will be free when the Chinese are free. I think people will be free for it to truth, non-violence. And you can practice that with full compassion. For me, no other way. Okay. So, no, I cannot believe this. No questions or you are all too shy or please feel free. I mean comments, questions, oh yes, please. The uh, clarification question. Um, you said uh, to hate someone is to hate yourself. Can you uh, be more clear about that? Why um, do I hate myself if I hate someone? Why can I just hate someone if I don't hate myself? Um, maybe you can speak up a little bit. Yeah, um, can you explain me, um, you said to hate someone is to hate yourself, right? Mm -hmm. To hate someone, yes. you also hate yourself. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why is this connection? Mm -hmm. no, in, in the Buddhist context, we are interrelated. They are not a single entity of the so-called self. The word self is useful and harmful. We have to realize that we are all interrelated. You see, I exist here because of you. Without you, I won't be meaningful here. So, if I hate you, hate doesn't come here. And that's the whole concept, you know. The trees, the part of me, without the trees, I cannot exist. This piece of paper comes from those trees. And those trees come from the cloud, from the rain. We are interrelated. And once you understand interrelationships, try to grow loving kindness, compassion, it will change. I think, if I may say so, the Cartesian concept, the, the Newtonian concept, Many, many good contributions to the West. But the Cartesian concept, Kokito Oko Sum, I, me, and competing, overcoming you, and you, not only other people, other gender, also other animals, three, the whole nature. I think the West must change that fundamental concept now. Not overcoming, not oppressing, not gaining. Into more compassionate, interrelated, be more humble, more respectful, and I think we will change meaningfully. You don't have to believe me, think about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, you have explained uh, that this situation in Myanmar, so-called Burma, uh, and you mean it, uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it leads to the suppressed. And uh, Wangshan uh, it is in the Burmese case. And, uh, on the other hand, the people and uh, Chinese is the different case. So in between, yeah, uh, uh, Suchi wants to create the uh, Myanmar in a, would be a democratic country. I think so. It is the, the that is the basic uh, things of the Aung Suchi. And uh, and besides that, Tibet wants to wants to a independent country. It's not like to be a democratic or something like that. So I think so. It, it, it is the different cases. So how long you have to wait for the peace? How long you will be salute to the Chinese? How long you will be wait for even then for the Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that? So how do you wait and how long you will be wait for 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 getting the peace? So it's in the Buddhist concept, don't think too much in the future. Right now, the most important thing right now for each of us is to breathe properly. We breathe in all the time, 24 hours a day, 20 days a week, but we don't take care of our breathing. We breathe in a lot of anxiety, conflicts, hatred, delusion, greed. Learn to breathe properly. First, cultivate love inside. So no competition. Without that, don't talk about the future. Learn to realize what is the most important. Not thinking, but breathing. <laughs> and that's what Aung San Suu Kyi has been doing when she was in China. You see? And now, of course, she's free. But you can't think Burma depends on one, one lady. In fact, I was in Burma just last week. I talked to a lot of former student leader who've been in jail 10 years, 20 years, and they were all oh, one heard through this and said, calm down now. Be Burmese, try to be Buddhist for the chair. Breathe properly. Don't expect the ladies to do everything. Change yourself and try to make friends with her. Be Kanayana Mitra. Talk to each other. So you have to change slowly. And Burma is quite interesting. Dictatorship since 1962. <clears throat> Until last year, almost entirely under Chinese hegemony. Now the country is free somewhat from the Chinese Empire. But more, if not careful, under American Empire. And if not careful, international cooperation are going to be great. Now I talk with them. It is not easy. But I think if you empower yourself, learning to use the base of local wisdom, the base of your own heritage, and in Burma, it's not only Buddhist, a number of Christian, a number of Muslim, and I'm very happy that I have been working with them for 15 years, and they are very much empowered. If you look for the future of the world anywhere, you have to look at the grassroots people, and these cars will be over in my country, in Burma, Indonesia, the area I know, that they have not been uprooted. Whereas those of us middle class have been uprooted so much to consumerism, capitalism, globalization. And they still have that beautiful concept of nonviolence, generosity. You know, I, I look at shit supposed to be the most backward tribe in Burma, next to China. And they told us, the Chinese, the Chinese came to them and said, we want to build big dam for you, for your benefits. They said, we don't want your, your, your generosity. Take it back. The Chinese was, this, this is the illiterate people, the Christian people. They don't want it. 
So I feel, you know, that if you listen to these people, and they become more and more empowered, and use non-violent approach, learn from them, and they will learn from you. And I think things will change. I see that the world changing. Okay, one number one, not that uh, Burma is going to change because of the 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 Aung San Suu Kyi. She is a, a lady, but not by her, not by great heroes. I think we have failed because we failed the Indian liberation thing with Gandhi. The old man had many many good positions, but he's too much of a male chauvinist. He's too much of a leadership. I think collective. Wisdom, non-violently. I think for me that's the answer. Yes. I heard you say one of the ways of um, resolving conflicts and making peace is through dialogue. And if I heard you well, you say it should be now. So supposing I'm in a conflict and uh, I want to make peace, and I seek dialogue. It never happens. You see, the Chinese don't want me to listen to the, the Tibetan right now. The Tibetan have to be more and more compassionate. You know, South Africa is a very good example. Apartheid. <coughs> you know, the leader was put in jail for 28 years, and he forgave them. He forgave the white oppressors. See, you have to have somebody you know, with charismatic leadership at the same time humble enough, spiritual enough to do things. The other side will change. And we have to share ourselves and then at the same time uh, offer the other sides. In my own country right now, in fact, uh, quite interesting, you know, uh, next week there's going to be a lecture here, you know. Rachel Thaksin and King contesting democracy in Thailand. I advertised it for Saturday, 27. Right now we have the red shirts against the King. But Thaksin, former Prime Minister, has a red yellow shirt. Very, very violent. You know? And I happen to know both sides. And I told him, number one, they must have time to talk to each other. I think they are not taking my advice seriously. Secondly, I said, the red shirt also one of people at the grassroots to, to join them. The red shirt. I said, but that's something wrong. You don't need them to join. You go and join them. You learn from the grassroots, you know. I think, it, I don't know how, 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 how seriously they, they take me, but the only good thing about me, I'm an old man. I know these people for 40 years and they know that I'm their friend. For me, I think there's a hope. If people listen, for me, democracy depends very much on local wisdom. It depends on empowerment of the people, not by experts. Buddha interview. But if you don't believe in the Buddha and the 
that diet. You can learn to be humble, learn to breathe properly, learn to be spiritual. You can be a very good <coughs> spiritual person by remaining an agnostic, an atheist. So religion could be useful and humble. You know what the Dalai Lama said? His religion is compassion. You know, I was the founder of the Inter International Network in Case, Buddhist. And when Jesus was found at 25 years ago, there was a Buddhist monk sitting, very old fashioned, Burmese Buddhist monk, two meters up all the time. And she says, Sula, this is a good organization, but don't propagate Buddhism. We have enough Islam in the world. Don't propagate Buddhism. You know, try to have dialogue with people. You know, learn from them, empower them, and they empower you. I mean, spiritual non violence. The best in religion, you know, in my book, uh, uh, the third advertising now, <laughs> she wrote peace. I make it very clear. Buddhism is small b, not, with, not with Buddhism with capital B. You see, in Sri Lanka, Buddhism is capital B. B. They kill the Tamils because the Tamils are not Buddhist. The president is a Buddhist president. And I was one on the people tribunal make judgment on him from committing the crimes against humanity. Because the Tamil put a white flag on, they surrender, and the president bombed, killed 60,000 women. He committed crimes against humanity. Of course, we are only people in tribunals. We have no legal jurisdiction, but we have morality. I think the UN is not debating. And this city is insecure. What do you do? Religion, my religion is the best. You are the I think that's the best. Yes? My uh, problem is to find uh, the words for the differences which for me exist between a belief that's personal and for my self development and the belief that structures society but also can be secularism um, next to the phenomenon of the Christian. Uh, uh, Christianity and a few accounts or the and Islam about it uh, structures a nation for example. So I think if we, if we talk about clash of cultures and religion like foundation, um, for example, I uh, had a theory about that. I always don't know where's, where's this difference and should we make this difference to, to find a new communication about, uh, about the issue of religion. Yes, it's understandable because different beliefs, different religions have conflicts. But if you concentrate on those differences, you never come to agreements. You see, right now, in fact, I have committed to come here. In fact, the International Network of Buddhists is now organizing Buddhist Christian dialogue, international, on climate change. If you have something common, dukkha, Common suffering, we can come together. Don't say we Christian are better, we Buddhist are better. We come together. What we can learn from Christian, what we can learn from in order to share climate change. If you take the issue of suffering, of dukkha, we come together. Muslim, whatever, you know. In that case, not that my religion is better than yours. We are different, different languages. We have to understand spiritual language, worldly language. And then I think we can come together. It's, it's essential that we come together rather than you know, challenging the differences. Yes. Um, I, I have a question that uh, may sound a little bit pessimistic, but uh, if you see the human history, it's always a history of war and then peace and war and peace. And uh, it's always like this, I, I think. From my perspective, uh, it never changed. Uh, from my perspective, it's just a scale. Now we are more. Now you see often, uh, because of the media, internet, you see every day, but it was always like this since a thousand years. And I hear your beautiful speech of love and forgiveness. And I'm pretty sure that many people uh, have this kind of speech in, in, in different centuries. And, uh, but and, and also there are 
again the speech of the of the evil, right? Let's say evil uh, of the of the that they propagate war and hate. But it's always like this. And, and, and from my perspective, we don't change. We are the same. Humans are the same. We are. I don't see any change, honestly, uh, from from the time of uh, 2,000 years ago. Now it's just a scale. Now we are much more. That's it. Uh, I don't know. Can you please help me out? <laughs> <laughs> what you said is very important. A change takes place all the time. For better or for worse. You can't say nothing changes. Even I change. I'm not 80. You know, when I see the not when I went through the war, I was only young man of by 60. Change, you see. But the point is that when you see changes, if you must use wisdom, skillful means of understanding to see it. And here in Europe, the Catholic and the Protestants have been killing each other for so long, but no longer. Now, if you believe in Huntington, the West will fight with the rest. And unfortunately, Bush believed in him, that's why the Muslims are bad, and so on. So if you have that line, things will be worse. But if you have a different approach, you know, we are friends. And as I said, you see, even Castro said, young American people have now become much more non-violent. Even, even a lot of young Europeans also have now at times meditate, they cultivate deep breathing, they appreciate that they relate to nature. I think that's a wonderful sign of change. If you look at the wonderful sign, of course those who have interest in producing arms, they have a lot of money involved. And they, they will cling to it. But at least they, they too will be defeated because I believe love and compassion will overcome violence. Not easy. Because when you read newspaper, television, all violence. Because that, that no capitalism, consumerism. But I keep on warning people. When big trees fall, big noise. But when the tree growing, you don't see the noise. <laughs> the trees are growing, you see, and in your university. Tremendous. This is young people, this is wonderful. And this is the future of the world. You see? I think the world will change because for our own survival, you see, it's tremendous. Even those big capitalists who made a lot of money, they also, their time and they also, themselves have to change. So you see a, a kind of positive uh, development or transition or evolution in, in humankind. Yes, on very much so, very much so, very much so. The, uh, the question of, of time, what, what he mentioned, uh, I mean, most of, of us here in the room are younger, you know, and uh, some live in countries with real hard dictatorship uh, or political conditions. And I understand the, the, the question of time. So, is the question of uh, what would you, would you suggest to young people who, uh, you know, have the feeling that if I don't do anything right now, uh, I have to wait my whole life and to, to be in a kind of a situation. Uh, depressed or uh, underprivileged, yes. uh, and I have to wait until I good time. So what is the my 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 answer is very simple. You learn how to breathe properly first. <laughs> <laughs> What's important element in your life? When you breathe properly, you cultivate love inside. It's very important. And with this loving kindness, what you need good friends. In the world, we have no good friends. Good friends are those who tell you what you don't want to hear. Good friends become your external voice of function. We need to change. It will be less aggressive. It will be more altruistic. We can learn to <coughs> see the other arm. More important we are. Even the trees are more important. When we have that perspective, you know, and I'm happy, you know, I meet a lot of young people they are changing. Even in my own country. You know, the great church, and I see a lot of change. Tremendous. You have to walk in yourself. You see, the vulnerable truth of birth, truth, truth of suffering. You must confront suffering. 
the people suffer, you know. Sometimes they even help you learn and they find out the cause of suffering and we can overcome suffering through mindfulness, through non-violence, through wisdom, through compassion. For me, no other way. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's quite interesting that you seem to talk from a, bit, to a different point of view. I mean, you told the last 2,000 years it has always been the same. Yeah. You seem to look from a very distant point of view. You didn't live during that time, but maybe you're just counting people suffering or people suffering from starvation or some, something. But I, I, I think so like you're doing something different. It's really about the here and now of the suffering that you experience. And obviously in this here and now relationships there are changes. So maybe from an abstract and distant point, nothing changes. But if you just look at this room, there's a lot of change going on. And I think there's an interesting ch change in focus. When you say it's about breathing, and if you really do this for even five minutes, you can experience change within yourself. You and know, I think uh, this kind yeah. of distant point of view at present, it really keeps us from being compassionate. Because it always feels, well, it doesn't matter what I do personally. So I think that is really uh, important, and it's also important in education, not just to talk about facts and numbers, but to really encourage people to enter a situation where it matters what they do. Yeah, um, I'm a little bit ambivalent when I hear this. I mean, on the one hand, I sure think it's very, very important to breathe, and that's it's a good point you're making. But on the other hand, as I said, I'm ambivalent. It's very wise, but on the other hand, it sounds a little bit cynic to me when you like look out there in the world, and right now there are people suffering, and maybe we're also responsible in a way for for their suffering or people dying or people working for almost no loan, and. Um, so that we can buy cheap products here and have a high standard of living. And I mean, also when you consider like the ecological crisis or something, time is running away there. You can, I don't know, if I see all these all this, um, problems the world and, uh, of the world, and if, when I see that there's like hardly any time, and then I hear, uh, I hear just the uh, advice, yeah, breathe. I don't know. If, it sounds cynic to me, also, in a way, and I don't know, but it's not really a question, it's just like a feedback. If you think that it, everything is so bad and nothing we can do, I think that is, that is a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> but I give you a very concrete example, Naropa University, the only Buddhist university in North America. They teach their people, number one, how to breathe properly, and then for the MA course on social engagement Buddhism, those students <laughs> must also take experience living in New York at the height of the winter, at least for one month, one dollar a day. They have to learn to see that how the, 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 the suffering New Yorker live under, in, underneath the underground nation and so on, but they have to be prepared also to empower themselves and share and something with people and try to find out the cause that they must also have good teachers. If you are serious on the suffering of people, you must share, understand their suffering, learn to make friends with them. That's why George Orwell becomes so great a writer. You know? He's he spent his life in the poorest of the poor, in London and Paris. See, and if you're serious, that's the only way. Or share with people who suffer. But John Orwell only used his intellectual Marxist analysis. I think we need beyond that. We need also our heart. Great respect. You see, I, that, uh, also in my medicine seat of peace, you can read it. It's on sale out there. This, this Nana working very positively for social change. We have to look out.
a lot of people are now working for social change. Mm -hmm. So have you heard to be a little bit more on social change? Yes, I think you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the, the, the social change issue, I think, is a very important one. And uh, uh, this, this May, June, uh, we had a big workshop with the ROC that said uh, on social change and mobilization uh, for change in a social manner. And so it's a very, very important thing also what our institute is, is, is doing there. So uh, you know, go away from this kind of uh, help the poor in one way or another. Yeah, I want to come back to your remark to look for commonalities rather than differences. Um, and I would like to share with you the work of an NGO, uh, NGO called uh, Search for Common Ground. I don't know whether you're familiar with them. Um, they started to work during the Cold War on a common topic between uh, the United States and Russia because they said there must be, we have some, some joint interests. But they now work all over the world and it sounds like they do a little bit of what you have been asking for. I mean, they go into regions of, of, of long past conflicts and they bring people of the well, opposing parties basically together and start actually with acknowledging what the say each other suffering and, and trying to understand why, uh, you know, what, what drives them to do certain things or whatever. Um, a lot of actually, well, I would call it character development. Um, it's not about poverty alleviation, whatever, but really getting people together and, and getting basically creating a larger base of water people in those situations. And what struck me is um, that the founder told me that she, she met uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and she took this compassion and kindness being into religion back and she says, I use that as, as a principle to work with my people. I tell them, you know, I make mistakes. Um, please, you know, please acknowledge I make mistakes and I do it the other way around. And that's the way how they develop their organization and they work with, I don't know, all around the globe, uh, 50 different nations all around the globe. Um, I've never thought about it, but she, she tries to apply those principles, uh, apply those principles, how to build and run an organization. I think that's quite impressive. And uh, I mean, they have established in, in areas where you would never think um, that that is possible, reconciliation work and actually access to mitigation, uh, out of court settlement, really to, to search for common ground. I think that's very, very impressive. And it sounds like she must have read quite a bit of what you're talking about. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful information. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is that we are living uh, in a resource scarce world. We are living in a scarce resource world. If there is scarcity, there is competition. If there is competition, there is conflict. So how can the world use this conflict possibly? For the betterment of social change, right? for building a new change, for new lots of experiences. So if you feel you are restricted so much, you can't do anything. Always look for something out there. Yeah. The Buddhist use the word skillful means. And that's why breathing properly is very important. One to become mindful, to become less egocentric. And that's good for me, which is government are not all that clever. Chinese and the corporation are not that clever. They have a lot of money, they have a lot of power, they can buy the best intellectuals, but they have no moral legitimacy. They have no spiritual input. It's a good thing that these of us have learned to be have moral courage, learn to have wisdom, compassion, and put friends together. Good friends of different nations, different religions. It's not good people that know. It's not beautiful in other people. And I speak from my own experience. I have been working in Burma for 15 years. I, I can see something. It was very oppressive. In my own country, I started a group 45 years ago. In five people meeting against the law, I had to use a very Holy Buddhist temple belong to the king, so that the, 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 the police will not invade. You have to do all kinds of things for me. You can do it. And then you can do it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the issue of bringing people together with similar thoughts from different angles, and this is one of the, the key uh, tools or instruments for promoting social change. And I mean, you have, you have so many years of experience, around 50 years of experience of bringing people together in different contexts with different ideas, but that kind of created revolutionary uh, movements in different, different political contexts, also spiritual contexts. And I think this is something that uh, 
is uh, worldwide important, and we see uh, things like the, the so-called Arab Spring, where people uh, bring them each other together <coughs> by, by mobile phones, and it, it will come here to uh, demolish uh, the uh, whole government uh, regimes who were in power since 30 years. So, um, where I saw some more questions. Being an Indian from my childhood, I have heard that the main principle of Buddhism is peace, non violence, as you were telling me. But as you told about the situation in Sri Lanka, the majority of them are Buddhists and they are fighting with Islam people. And the war has ended, it's almost three decades now, but still now Tamils remain in a disadvantageous position. They have been disappearance for every five days or so like that. So why is it not possible? I mean, this religion, Buddhism, that to uh, follow non-violence and peace in their country? Why well, is they, this still going practice, on? That they practice Buddhism with capital B, become nationalistic. You know? In my own country, Buddhism was going along very well, very well with capitalism, consumerism, feudalism. That's why religion, you have to be careful. Get to the base of it. The worst of it could be very, very harmful. Tamils are almost suffering like anything till now. Also. Yeah, but at the same time, you have to look at it. Even in Sri Lanka now, quite a number of Buddhists have come, come a lot. They want to work closely with the Tamil, with the Christian. And, you, know. you have to start coming small, authentic group of people. Yes, yes I think it's, yes. Um, you just pointed out compassion is like one of the most important things in life. Yes. Um, when I, I, I study economics, when I read my economic textbooks, um, one of the first sentences I read is that we have to look on the words objective without compassion. And um, my question is actually, uh, we all face, um, we all have to take decisions in life. And sometimes these decisions are very, very difficult because on each side of the decision is suffering. And um, my question is, is how, like, I can understand the fascination of, of being objective because it's a possibility to take a decision thinking that you're doing the right thing. So, my question is, how should we take decisions? How should we take what? Decisions. Yes. Decisions? Yes. With compassion, like... Your question is, is, is essential. We usually make decisions, we make judgments, and most of our judgments are made out of four conditions which we are not aware of. We make our judgments out of love. Somebody we love, he or she is okay. We make out of hatred, somebody we hate uh, no good. We make this in our fear, sometimes fear of our safety, fear of our, lose our freedom. It's very subtle. And worst of all, we make this in our delusion. We don't really know. And we think we know. We only know intellectually. That's why to make a rightful decision, you need to learn. Again, starting how to breathe properly in order to sterilize that. Don't take ourselves too seriously. Don't make the ego become so important. Learn to be humble. Learn that we are interrelated. And then uh, if you have some doubts, try to do something more positive. That even positive thing may be wrong, but better than negative. And you learn from experience. To be less at this mistake. Many decisions are mistaken, but learn to be more mature. The, the less selfish you are, the, 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 when you see things at their really uh, good, good decision, uh, most likely to be on the right track. Otherwise, we make wrong decisions. Most politicians make wrong decisions, you know, because they are so selfish. Most big companies make wrong decisions because they are controlled by greed. So you have to learn.
be less greed, less deluded, and less hatred, then perhaps we may make a right decision. And I have made many decisions, and if I may say so, many of my decisions have been made wrongly. Yes, uh, thanks for your, your, your talk. And uh, my question is regarding how can we bridge, how can we build bridges between uh, a community sense of compassion and a more universal, global sense of compassion? I, I find that it's probably easier to, to be compassionate in, in a community local level because it's easier to see the, the suffering in others as your suffering. But that's certainly not enough if we want to do a better work. Uh, we, we need social social change and we need others to, to get uh, a better off as well. But uh, so so we need a certain uh, kind of universal compassion as well. But when we go to that level of Compassion, it's it seems much harder to articulate people with, uh, and reach consensus, and it's also easier to to lose uh, the grassroots participation, have top-down processes, or come to a point where this compassion becomes something really abstract that really can't uh, go to the ground. So, uh, how do you see this the connection between these two levels from from the the best is the community. In Buddhism, we call the Sangha. The Sangha, you can, it means the community. Essentially, it must have equality between the different gender also. Equality. Fraternity, you must have that love and kindness, and, and, and you must work together for liberty, for greed, hate and delusion. That, and I'm happy, you know, by number of sangha firm, you know, learn to be humble, learn to respect nature, learn to social change. You know. The good thing about this day and age, you know, you have this internet connection. You see, I have a small group at Ashram starting 30 years ago, very small, you know, how they keep living, you know, uh, no chemical stuff, we store our own rice, our own food, and, you know, and that type of meditation, and also open for those who are burnt out to come and have a retreat weekend and so on. Luckily now we also have something like Finn Horn and Green Scotland, we have alternatives, and now we ring together, see, and then we come together, see, so, the good thing, you know, I mean, more than gadget and many, many negative things, it's also been some. We can link together, you know, link together and learn from each other. Some, some of them are very much of a Christian background, some of them in France, very, very Christian, but very humble, lovely, based in, in, in Christian uh, teaching. Possible. I think we build up that networking. They have to be hopeful. Yes. <coughs> Thank you for your speech. And <coughs> you speak loudly. I, I yeah, sorry, I had something in my throat. <laughs> I was uh, wondering, um, you, you just um, talked about the community Fintorn in Scotland. Yes. And um, this was very interesting as you quoted or were talking about this um, community because I'm also living in one in Portugal, and for me, um, I just wanted to ask you whether you could uh, draw a little bit a picture of a community life or a perspective on a on a human level, like how can humans live together? Because for me, this is yeah, kind of the, the perspective, like where we can actually look forward to, or which is a higher picture compared to all the crisis areas and all the conflict areas. Maybe you can say some more words about what you experienced there or what, yeah, how this picture can look like. I 
I wish I could, because I'm no longer young, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you very much. I think you better help me rather than my bicycle. So. But I think, you know, if you want to, you need to start, you know, with two, three friends first, you know, and learn to know who you are. And then four or five good friends telling you what you don't want to hear, and how, how, how you grow. To be, you know, to be more mature. But most important, for those of you in Western Europe, you must always open yourself to the oppressed. They are even in Europe, but of course, plenty in Asia, Africa. You should really, if you have any time, <coughs> money, go and stay with them for at least a month or so, learn different culture, how, how suffer they are, and at the same time, how, how they empower themselves. I think the world needs that kind of linkage. And I think the young now they have much better opportunity than my time. Yes. Uh, I have just a thought which came to my mind. I'm a little bit getting a little bit old now. Will <laughs> 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 be the last question? Sorry? Please. Last question. Okay. Uh, somebody there said that over the last decades and thousands of years, there have been wars in times of peace again, and people fighting for peace and no change. And just a thought which came to my mind: what would have been? There would have been nobody working on peace. Then maybe it would have just all the time had war. And this gives hope to me in a way. I mean, there's no ch overall change that we now have peace all the time, but at least we have periods of peace and we have love in the world and we have compassion. And I think it's really. Even then, it's worthwhile to work on it and to, to constantly work for peace and work on it. And Frances Mulapé, if I may cite her again, she said a wonderful thing some weeks ago. She said, democracy is nothing we can have. It's something we have to live. And we have to currently work on it. And I think with peace, it's the same thing. We can never achieve it. I think we always have to currently work on it. And this thought just came really back to my mind. Thank you for your words of wisdom. <laughs> I have one request for the group, like, I see a lot of people are leaving the room and I think it's quite um, annoying and disturbing for the process we have. I know it's hard to listen all the time and we, have, we are working since seven days, I think, but I think it's also a sign of respect to stay in the room and to listen to the, to the people and not leaving the room all the time. I mean, it's just one and a half hours and everybody should be able to do that, I think. Maybe, maybe you see it differently, but I think it's very... It's like a sign of respect for everyone to stay in the room. Yeah, we're, we're, we're true, and uh, we'll have enough coffee breaks and toilet breaks, so uh, I think every one and a half or two hours there's a real break, so we can just the opportunity. Uh, Great. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you so much. So much.